Hi folks, it's Steve Harganon and welcome to day one of the Global Education Conference. We have back-to-back uh, -back keynotes from Jennifer Klein, first in Spanish and now in English. To say that Jennifer's a friend might be stretching it a little bit, I'm a fan. <laughs> I'm a big fan Friends of Jennifer. Good. Friends good. Friends good. <laughs> uh, she'll tell you about her work. We're really delighted to have her here again. Thank you so much, Jennifer. My pleasure, Steve. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who is choosing to participate in this session. Um, those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Klein. I have been in education for 29 years um, as a teacher, as well as as a leader in the last few years. Um, I worked as a consultant for many years as well. I'm currently the rectora or head of school at Gimnasio Los Caobos, which is located just north of Bogota, Colombia. Um, basically a suburb to the north of Bogota. Um, I am also the founder of Principled Learning Strategies through which I do support uh, schools, teachers, leaders um, in any way that I can um, uh, in the transformation of education. And I'm the author of the book, uh, The Global Education Guidebook. And tonight I'm here to talk about the experience that we've been having, uh, or that I've been having, um, trying to lead global innovation in a school that is located in a very traditional educational context. I do think it's important to start by saying that when I say that a context is traditional, that does not mean um, that it is a bad context uh, at all. <laughs> um, I think we sometimes assume, those of us who are in innovation, circles can tend to assume that if it's in a, that if it's not innovative it must be bad and I don't think that there is anything actually bad in a school or a culture or a system being traditional but as times change education obviously needs to as well um, we certainly haven't gotten it perfect um, we haven't figured out all the bugs we haven't managed to solve all the challenges that have come up um, but we're learning and what I want to do today is share a little bit of our learning um, both our successes and our challenges and then specifically some of the strategies strategies that we're using, which I hope can transfer into other contexts, uh, particularly for those of you who are participating today, um, who are leaders uh, and who are trying to lead this kind of work, perhaps in a traditional context. So I'll start with our driving question because I'm a PBL educator and I always need to start with a question. Our question tonight is how might we foster increasingly student-centered, globally engaged practices in traditional educational contexts? So I'll share a little bit about what I mean by a traditional educational context. Some of what I mean really is a traditional social context as well. Um, so the Colombian context, um, as most of you probably know, global educators tend to know this and even to spell Columbia right, which is always a delight for me to see. Um, we are uh, in the midst still of a war that has been going on, a civil war that's been going on for over 50 years. This is a war with far more than just two sides. It is an incredibly complicated war that has to do to some degree with human rights and needs, but to a large degree with the needs of, of uh, drug lords and, um, and that kind of thing is well uh, and the production of cocaine in our country um, and so this is it's is a really messy really long war um, it's very very difficult one to solve and, and I believe always that war brings it with it a tendency to hold on to the traditional so that creates a, just definitely creates a challenge for us we're also at a point where we are in a peace process um, and a lot of Colombians would love to say that we are now post conflict but I think when we're being realistic we're not post anything yet um, um, we are in the process, um, but what we've seen in elections as well as in the elections that had to do with the peace process itself is that we are a heavily divided society, meaning that we have an average 50%, 50% kind of a split in almost anything that you might survey uh, in the country. Um, and that's because the country, half the country still feels that we haven't solved the problem and the other country, the other half of the country thinks it's just fine. Um, this creates all sorts of challenges and I'm not going to get too political in this session at all, but I am going to say that the, the socio-political situation um, definitely has a very, very direct ex um, impact on education um, because it makes people all the more paranoid or fearful about the well-being of their children and what comes next and their ability to handle whatever it is that comes next. Um, and so that can have a really direct and major impact on education. Um, it is also a very traditional educational system in itself. Um, all of the teacher preparation is, or the majority of teacher preparation that is happening in the country is highly, highly traditional. Um, that means that all of my teachers were educated traditionally themselves and professionally prepared 
in traditional ways as well. Um, that means that, you know, when I say who experienced an education centered in students, I'm the only one in the room <laughs> raising my hand. Um, that means that we have a lot to unlearn. It means, as my teachers say, that we have to cambiar el chip or change the chip in the brain that makes us think that education is a teacher at the front of the room giving lectures and kids taking notes in, in their seats in rows. Um, we also have a very, very big challenge in what is the high stakes exam, the national exam. And the national exam is the entry point into university for our students. That means that we can't ignore it. We can't pretend that it's not important. Um, it's much, much bigger, uh, honestly, and bigger stakes than say the SATs, although it has some similarities. Um, it's, it's bigger and higher stakes because um, whereas in the United States, we, we have the SATs, but we also have, you know, the interview and the essays and you can submit a portfolio and you can, you know, you can go do the interviews and there are all these other ways that you can show who you are as a student besides numbers and grades and exams. Um, here, your point value on the exam really decides which universities you can choose from. Um, and if you're right on the edge, a conversation and interview might make a difference but so far we have we don't have universities that are accepting student portfolios they're not interested in anything much more than just the number um, and that creates some major challenges for tr for non-traditional or alternative education um, we also have some of the lowest PISA scores um, on the on the global level um, we are at the bottom in terms of Latin America um, war I think has a lot to do with that because it, it um, created significant um, significantly more disenfranchisement of specific communities that couldn't be reached easily or where no teacher would be willing to go and live because of the political conflict. Um, but uh, the low PISA scores obviously are also an issue of national pride. Um, and so traditional, when, when you've got that fear of what could happen um, and what it means to be at the bottom of the, of the pile, then you get more, you tend to get more traditional practices um, popping up because people want to hold on to something that they believe, even if they're wrong, was more effective or feel somehow more effective. And then finally, we have the Venezuelan refugee crisis. Um, this in itself is not necessarily a challenge to education directly, but Colombia has received um, at this point about a million and a half Venezuelan refugees that we know of. This is taxing all governmental systems, um, all gov governmental systems. Um, it's also creating an increase in xenophobia, um, which is pretty scary to watch happen. Um, in our own school, we're not necessarily seeing a lot of that. We're, uh, we're experiencing some additional bullying um, of Venezuelan students who come in, for example, so it does have the ripple effect in that sense. But I think more than anything else, it just means that the government system is incredibly overtaxed and does not um, over exhausted, overused, um, and is not necessarily up to the challenge. We're still a small country and to receive that many people and they're continuing to flood in. Um, obviously, I want to see how education can help with that, um, but it is a challenge to our work. So George Kuro says that there are 10 stories that great leaders should know how to tell and tell well. I'm not gonna tell all 10 of them, certainly. I think it's a great list so that I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it up here for a minute. Um, some of them, of course, have to do with how we market our schools. Some of them have to do with how we sell our schools, um, how we convince people to come work for us. Um, uh, some of them are the more um, personal leadership stories, and I can certainly say that I model my leadership after some of my most important mentors. Those mentors include Arnold, Arnold Langberg in Colorado, the, front, the founder of um, the second educa uh, experiential educational program in the United States, um, the Open School in Colorado outside of Denver, um, which is where I graduated from. I'm also guided in many important ways by the work of Judith Bannon, um, an expert in middle school learning, um, who was my boss at St. Mary's Academy in Denver for many years. So those are just a couple of examples of people who influenced the way that I treat to lead. But I'm going to share five stories in particular briefly to give you a little bit of a grounding in caobos. Um, and I should clarify that the word caobos is the name of a tree. It's a type of magnolia tree um, that grows in the area. So, and the word gimnasio is a signal that we are an open campus, meaning that, uh, not open, but a uh, um, a, a campus with countryside, a campus with um, big green open spaces for outdoor education. 
So where we came from, um, Kaobos was founded in 1991 um, by a priest who was at the time the rector of um, one of the most important universities in Bogota, La Havariana, um, and uh, a family, a private family. And they worked together to create an education that would be founded in humanism, um, a humanist curriculum. It's a what we call Catolica Laica, which means that it is a Catholic school, but it's not an, a confessional school. Um, so it is an inclusive Catholic school where we do accept students from other religions um, and where there's an openness or an inclusivity to the way we think of, about religion. Um, and the intention was always to build a, a, the kind of community where students were treated like human beings and where the school would be able to contribute to the growth of the society itself, right? Would be able to create the leaders for tomorrow. This is a private school. Um, it appeals to or draws from the very top sectors, socioeconomic sectors of the country. Um, interestingly enough, in, in Colombia, they're actually numbered um, very specifically. Um, and so we're educating some of the most powerful and rich uh, students in the world, in the country, pardon me, and we are um, doing so with the intention to create conscientious leaders who are connected to the people around them who, who innovate not just to make money themselves, but who really innovate to try to create social change. I personally believe very, very strongly um, that education is an incredible uh, means of creating social change. Um, why we can't stay here? Well, about six years ago when the school started to suffer from some financial difficulties, but also from um, the changes in the society around them, it became very clear that a traditional education was not going to be the way or the best way anyway um, to, to create that kind of um, leader who thought about others, right? The kind of leader who would be able to um, to really create, you know, do something different, not just continue with the norms. It, in other words, it became clear that what we needed was a 21st century education, right? An education that was centered in the students that developed their passions and their talents, but that also um, uh, met the needs of the educational or the traditional educational system around them. Um, the kind of education that would create leaders who thought about others, not just themselves and, and all of that. So that required a, a shift in pedagogy. And as I said, that began about six years ago. Um, the where we're going is connected obviously to that shift. The belief was that we needed to make significant changes, not only in the way we teach, but also in our classroom spaces. So we have, um, we've converted almost all of our classrooms. I think we've got about two more years to go still. Um, but what we've been doing is taking out brick walls and putting in glass walls, taking away the artificial front of the classroom and turning it into a more collaborative space, getting rid of stationary desks, encouraging much more collaborative learning space uh, design uh, in those classrooms. And then the glass all obviously also allows the students to feel connected to the world outside the classroom, but then also allows teachers, for example, to watch groups work outside so that we don't have to always do all of the group work inside the classes because they're not all very large spaces. Um, my vision comes in large degree, to large degree, and this is why they hired me for this role, um, from my own experiences. Um, I attended a wonderful school outside of Philadelphia called the School in Rose Valley for the first years of my life that's founded in the ideas of Grace Rotzel, um, founded by her, but also based in her philosophies. Grace Rotzel, I like to think of as sort of the female John Dewey, just as important, but not as well known because of being female at the time, um, in that time period, I should say. Um, and then also the open school and the way that I was educated to think about learning, um, to see myself as a, as a participant or a protagonist in my own learning experiences. Um, and then of course, in particular terms, we're talking about project-based learning, right? And that's been a big part of it. So how we're gonna get there, Project-based learning was the first pedagogical shift that was made, the transfer, the, the reconstruction of the classrooms. All of this was designed to shift the directions of education. Um, in a lot of ways, though, I think that a lot of those shifts were done without thinking about the way that the external community was going to view them. And I think that's really what I've ended up having to do is kind of clean up some of the mess that comes from making those kinds of changes inside the school while on the outside of the school, the society itself was not necessarily becoming less traditional. Um, and what we believe, uh, we believe that the young people we're educating are going to lead the future of the country. We believe that 
a, a young person who's had a chance to really develop their talents and really explore their sense of purpose and, and how they, who they want to be and how they want to contribute, as opposed to just being educated in, in a cookie cutter model <laughs> where every kid in theory turns out the same, except that they don't because they're all different. Um, that that's not valuable to us, that we really want to educate young people who, who are destined for a million different paths. Uh, uh, as an example, I'll say that we compiled a list of the, the career fields that our students who graduated last year are going into. And I was so gratified to see like 30 different career fields, maybe even more uh, than 30 different career fields um, chosen by our students. For me, that's a sign that we are giving them a chance to develop their passions in our uh, school and that we're giving them a chance to understand what what matters to them what they're good at how they want to contribute and that that does amazing 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 things for for them and for us um, in the broader society so a few of the challenges um, i was saying to steve before we got started that i think the reason it took me two and a half years to give this talk frankly is because um, for a good two years, well, maybe a year and a half, I couldn't figure out how to talk about parents <laughs> in a way that respected the experience that they have um, and the perspectives that they bring to the table. Um, so I finally figured it out. <laughs> I'm gonna say that they're resistant parents. Um, but what I mean by that is that they're scared of failing their kids. And I think we see this all over the world when we try to do something different, that they were educated themselves in a traditional way. It's what they know. It's, it's something that they feel they know works, although I, I'm not sure that I agree with that, but I understand why they think so. Um, and it's scary for them to step outside of that. It's scary to imagine that this, that this education that their children are receiving is going to be what they need it to be. Uh, that it's going to get them into the right universities, that it's going to give them all the, that basis of knowledge that so many parents still believe is so important, even though I can pick up my phone and find most of it in 30 seconds or less. Um, I think too, and it's not just parents, it's teachers as well. I think there's a perception of rigor as being key to academic success. And this is something that I've written about a couple of times because I really think it's such a mistake. It's almost like, it's almost like adults often think that if my kid comes home happy, that means they're not learning anything. It almost means that if my kid comes home not suffering and having to drill something for hours and hours or five hours of homework every night, that, that we're not educating them well. Um, I think that's such a mistake. I think uh, you can have a beautiful, wonderful growth experience in an educational program and still get all the right stuff, whatever the right stuff is. I really do believe that. But that perception obviously pushes back against the kinds of things we're trying to do. And we have parents who will say, not just parents, but people, especially in the first year, who would say, my kid's not doing anything. Because even the kid couldn't perceive how much work was happening because the classroom was so active and enjoyable to be in. Um, so yeah, so that's a big, big piece of it. Um, we also have teachers without any student-centered practices in their training or in their personal experience. Um, and that means that they're learning something they can't even imagine um, because they didn't experience it themselves. Um, that means too that we can't count on our training programs to bring us teachers who are already prepared in, in project-based learning um, because they, we just don't have university programs that are doing that in their preparations of teachers. Um, we have a problem which I think is a really common problem around the world, especially in the higher levels, secondary university, and that is the, um, the teachers who love their disciplines more than teaching. <laughs> um, and I say this with all due respect because I think I was, you know, I, I love literature. Being a literature and English teacher, a writing teacher, I loved that. I had a lot to say about the literature too, you know, but I think sometimes when teachers go into the field because they love their discipline more than they love kids, it can create some challenges. And again, I'm not teacher bashing, I'm not blaming them for that, but I think that those teachers have often been the hardest to transform because they see education as something very static, uh, as something that, you know, that where I have all this stuff that I need to share and I need to be the one to share it and it's very difficult for them to see beyond that um, and to see that their kids should be the ones doing the investigating, that their kids could be the ones coming up with the right answer or developing something completely new um, that's threatening or it's challenging for them. Um, 
And then finally, the high stakes exam uh, context. And I will say, I'm watching the questions over on the side, but in the, in the interest of making sure that I complete everything, I'm not responding to them right now, but I love the questions that I'm seeing and thank you and the comments. Thank you so much for, for being active and uh, participants. I really do appreciate it. Um, the high stakes exam context obviously has high stakes for students, right? As, as a couple of you have said in the chat, it's very sad that they won't accept portfolios. We're going to get them there, though. I think we're, and I'll explain some of the strategies we're using later, but I think we will get them to that point. Um, but it has very high stakes for the universities um, that the students will be able to uh, even consider. And our kids do go to the top five or six universities in the country, um, as well as studying in the external world. And so we definitely have to make sure that their exam score are as high as humanly possible. It also, though, has stakes for the school, and this is something that I have not seen in the past uh, in other countries. Um, our school rankings, obviously, depend on this, and there's an, an, a magazine that every fall, it should be coming out shortly, every fall they rank all of the schools based on their exam scores. Um, so if you're not in the top 100, you're not even going to show up in the news in the article. Um, you're not going to be listed as the best schools in the country, um, and it has a major impact then, too, on our enrollment, obviously, because families will see that list in the, new, in the magazine um, and make decisions based on it to a large degree. Um, but it also has an impact on our ability to, set, to set our costs, and this is something I have never seen elsewhere, meaning that um, our, what we can charge families is based on how well we did in ICFAS during the year. Um, and so basically that exam that, sorry, I keep using that term ICFAS, that's the, the way, what it's called, or prueba saber is the, the national exam. If we have a low year in ICFAS, we can't raise the prices as much. If we have a really great year, we can raise the prices more. I'm not in a, a fan of really high cost education or anything, but it does impact our working budget very directly because we are a, a for-profit school, not a non-profit school, which means that we can't fundraise other ways than through tuition. So when it comes to the strategies and the successes we've seen, I do, before we get into that, I did want to make that distinction between rigor and vigor. And this was a distinction that was made to me by Arnie Langberg when I was about 16, actually. Um, and, uh, and so it's become the heart of how I think about uh, education, honestly. We so often hear teachers and people in education use this term rigor like it's the golden star in the North. Um, but when we look at the, what the word means, it's not the right word for education in my my opinion, it's a very wrong word, in fact, for describing education because it means rigidity or firmness. Um, and in fact, the word in Latin that it comes from uh, means directly inflexibility or rigidity. Rigor mortis is what happens after someone passes away. It's not what I believe a good education looks like. I do think, though, that we can create an education that's vigorous, that's based in vigor, in energy, and, and living force, um, that's based in effort, energy, and enthusiasm, um, where students are full of life, as the um, Latin term suggests. Um, and I think we can still reach the same goals, and I think we can still reach the same high level of work, but we can do it in a way that makes sense, that's enjoyable that's about students loving every second of it and and yes doing some things that make them miserable but in the service of something that they care about um, I often use my Spanish as an example I you know I drilled Spanish verbs and conjugations for years um, to get them right um, none of that was fun but it was all motivated by something that was much more centered in vigor than it was in rigor so some of our successes um, took me two full years, but I managed to get rid of the bells. Um, we now have a culture of teaching and learning where students and teachers generally are getting to class on time without our having to have bells. Um, I really appreciate that. I think that the prison system is what works by bells, and I don't think that school systems should have to. Um, we have one significant interdisciplinary project per trimester at every single grade level. That means that students have interdisciplinary learning experiences from very, very young, as young as four years old, and I'll show examples of those in a little bit. We have been able to make some significant shifts toward vigor in our language about learning and language about education and teaching so that teachers are much more focused on engaging them in a vigorous way than in a rigorous way. Um, 
teachers are also slowly becoming willing to experiment more um, and we've seen a slow disappearance of a culture of fear which was what i encountered when i first arrived two and a half years ago i really did i was actually quite surprised by how fearful the teachers were of trying new things and i quickly discovered that they were all just scared to lose their jobs and it was so so far outside of what they were used to what they were being asked to do um, that um, that they were a lot of them were really paralyzed um, and and weren't trying new things because they were we, they were sure that at some point we were going to change our minds and go back to the old way um, and that they didn't really even know how to ensure success in this new way um, so we've been able to see that change um, we've also been able to create an increasingly constructive and collaborative parent culture it's taken a lot of work and it's taken a mindset change on my part completely um, but we've been able to, to make some really important strides and again i'll share the strategies behind these these successes uh, as we go um, we've also been able to improve the alignment between our projects and academic indicators this is something those of you who are in project-based schools or student-centered pedagogies of other kinds know um, is one of the biggest tricks is to make sure that the projects actually do align to, to whatever the curricular standards need to be um, and when I arrived, I didn't find that that was true. I found that a lot of the projects were based on cool and interesting ideas, but they weren't actually aligned to uh, the curricular expectations of the grade level or discipline. So that's been a major, major change that we've been working really hard on together. Um, and then finally, we've in managed to increase, although we need to still increase it further, the emphasis on narrative evaluation, which would be the self-evaluation, the peer evaluation, the teacher evaluation, all of that in a more narrative and formative form um, over just letter and number grades um, for example when i arrived the only students that were getting narrative comments were those who were failing and doing very poorly and now students who are doing very well also receive like all students receive narrative evaluation and have multiple opportunities in the classroom as well to evaluate themselves and their peers and to reflect on their learning and their needs so a few project examples. Uh, it's always good to be able to imagine it in action. Um, this was a project that was done in pre-kinder. So the four-year-olds and five-year-olds did this project. Um, the driving question was, how can we create an organic infirmary to help sick kids at Caobos? We have a um, national laws that prohibit the nurse from giving any kind of medicine to, to younger children. Um, only, I think it starts at maybe 15 or something that they're able to give a little bit more medicine. I'm not sure exactly the age, but this is a major problem. It means that the only thing the infirmary can do when a younger child arrives at their office sick is call the parents and make them a cup of tea. And so what the students did was they learned about plants and medicinal plants and that kind of thing in the area. And they created these little books, as you can see in the picture, but then they also created a little garden for the nurse, which now lives in the infirmary and which allows her, when a kid comes in with a specific ailment, to choose the plant that would be the most appropriate plant to make into tea. So they still receive tea, but it's obviously a bit better at um, solving their um, health challenges. This one comes from, I believe it was sixth and seventh grade last year, and I should clarify that above, um, above kindergarten, our grades are one number off. Um, so our sixth grade would be US seventh grade, um, and our seniors are 11th graders, right, the last year. They're the same age as seniors in the United States, but because we have one additional year between kinder and first grade, um, all the numbers get offset, just so that that makes sense. Um, this one was a project to um, that was actually based on a social problem we were having at school where we had a, a fair number of students um, not necessarily bullying but a lot of teasing based on stereotypes and a teacher got really angry about it and, and I encouraged her to turn it into a project so this became an interdisciplinary pod project that included English um, social studies um, uh, steam which is how they they were learning about the photography elements through steam and I think there was at least one other uh, discipline involved um, in this project they were really looking closely at the way that stereotypes divide us and what they're based on or not based on um, and students did a lot of work around understanding themselves and understanding the way that they might be stereotyping others in other in order to really be able to break some of those stereotypes it was a really cool project that I think a lot of a lot of us really uh, enjoyed and learned something from. This one came from high school. This is um, a, an interdisciplinary project as well. Does science change, sorry, does history change science 
or does science change history? Um, while this is not a driving question that sounds like it's going to invite more than a yes or no answer or a one or the other answer, the truth is that the teachers knew that and they designed this question very specifically because they believe that the two are interrelated. And so what students were exploring history and understanding how scientific um, achievements had impacted history, um, but they also looked at the way that history impulsed those scientific achievements. So it was really a, a, a always sort of a combination of both. As the at the end of the project, all of the students created products um, where they tried to use their scientific learning and their scientific understandings um, to create a change, something that would would change history. Um, and it was a really it was a neat project um, and really motivating. This was ninth grade, um, what would be tenth grade in the United States. This project actually is one that many of you probably are familiar with because it comes from iron and it's the Machinto project. Um, this is a great, great project that we used um, in, we did it in kindergarten in, I believe it was fifth grade and then also in ninth grade. So for the kindergartners, it was all about making friends, right? How being friendly and using our values and understanding other people can make, can transform daily actions into actions of peace. At the fifth grade level, they were really starting to understand some of the challenges of um, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and were looking at, um, in a light way at least, at parallels between um, that war and the war um, in Colombia and, and looking at how to make sure that we don't end up in the same situation. And then in the ninth grade level, of course, at an even deeper level, um, what would be US 10th, um, students were really exploring very deeply um, those connections, like what can we learn from Hiroshima that can allow us to um, improve the peace process and build peace in Colombia. Um, we also have three really stellar projects, uh, entrepreneurship projects that we do in the high school in eighth, ninth, and 10th grade, or ninth, 10th, and 11th in US terms. Um, the first one is a more general one. The second is, uh, has a bit of a focus on human rights, and the third has a focus on sustainability. Um, and some really extraordinary projects have come, or products have come out of this work. A few quick examples. Um, a student of ours uh, created a video game designed to teach young people with Down syndrome how to manage traffic in an urban setting. So when to cross the street and when not to, what the different signals mean, um, all of those kinds of things to ensure that young people would be able to move around in the city safely. Um, another group of students created a drone that would allow us to find um, chemical plastic landmines in the country, um, locate them, uh, determine whether there were dangers in the area, plot them on a GPS map for cleanup, and in some cases actually explode them uh, right there. Um, and then another that came out this year, which I'm very proud of, is a young person who um, developed a drone, not a drone, sorry, a, a telephone application um, designed to allow the client to find businesses that uh, use green practices. And what he said to me and, and in his presentations, he's one of uh, several different awards for this uh, innovation. Um, and it'll be in production, it'll be available on, mark, on the market soon. Um, but what he said uh, to me was that he, one part of his intention was the service to the client because he really wanted to um, make sure that people who wanted to practice green, green living knew where they could go and which, which um, companies or organizations to shop with. Um, but then he also wanted to create a uh, um, pressure on the uh, the businesses themselves that they had to change their practices they had to start doing some of this um, to be able to get um, the business that they wanted right and to be able to appear on the app so strategies um, I will say this first strategy was probably the hardest to develop from my perspective um, but it was the strategy of using intentional messaging to and construction constructive involvement of our stakeholders and when I say stakeholders I really do mean parents more than anybody else um, the first strategy that we used to really make sure that they understood what we were trying to do and that they were involved in it in a constructive way as opposed to a destructive why don't you go back to traditional educating kind of way was to um, to start at what we call the cafe con la rectora. So this is something that I started my first year there. Um, we meet with, I meet with parents once a month. The first year it was purely a complaint session and I would come out with my cuticles torn to bits and my nails bitten and it was awful. Um, and we quickly learned at the end of that year that it needed to be design, redesigned. And so what we did was we redesigned it 
in a PBL fashion. Um, and so now every month the parents come together with me and we deal with problems and challenges that they're dealing with at home or issues that matter to them um, that they're seeing at home. Um, for example, last month we looked at how they could be supporting bilingualism from home. Um, uh, we've done things around the social pressures of social media and how to help their, young, their students um, in middle school ages, things like that, um, to really understand how to navigate um, and avoid the dangers of social media. Um, as you can see from the photograph here, uh, parents, these are always collaborative workshops. They are always PBL style in design, and the parents really are solving their own problem for themselves. Um, and it's been incredibly successful, whereas we have a very difficult time drawing parents in for events in general. Um, what we found was that the Café con la Rectora can easily pull 50 to 75 parents every single month. Um, the second one is Escuela para Padres or School for Parents. This is a program that's run by our teacher, our parents association. Um, and this year, for example, they're putting on three different workshops for each of our sections. So three for elementary, three for middle, and three for pri for high school. Um, and they're this year they're focused on uh, they're being taught by a psychologist who's also a mother at the school, um, who has an incredible background. So in the and we're working on social challenges and and um, child raising challenges. So so the, the junior school parents are focusing a lot on uh, the, the talks are, or the workshops are focusing a lot on what it means to, to raise happy, healthy, um, values-based young people who know how to pe treat other people well. Um, middle school, they're talking about social media and all those things that are starting to pop up in the lives of, of preteens um, and, uh, and, and how to help them through all of those social pressures and things and the you know peer pressure and all of that. And then at the high school level, we're looking at substance um, substance abuse, uh, alcohol, drugs, how to help your students understand how to keep themselves safe in that in those ways in terms of sex, in terms of a lot of different topics. So they've been really successful this year, I feel like is the first year that we've been truly successful at making Escuela para Padres really work. Um, in terms of communication and messaging, what's news is something that we put out regularly on social media. These are short films. These are um, photos recognizing a kid who won an award for something. Um, we put out a about one film a week, one one minute film a week, as well as lots and lots of news posts on Facebook and Instagram and, and all of that. And part of it is a marketing strategy, but the other, and a messaging strategy to parents. But it, a, another part of it really is about the pride, you know, uh, that a parent feels when they see these amazing things that are going on. So it's no longer oh, I'm at the school that's a little different and maybe a little weird and I'm not sure how I feel about it and it's and nobody else seems to be doing it so I'm being quiet about it and it helps them shift toward look how lucky I am that I get to be a part of a school that's doing something different. You know, look at these amazing things that our kids are doing. It really helps to shift, to shift the mindset in my experience. Um, and then finally, we have the School of 600 Teachers. This is an initiative that we started to really try to get the parents involved in more constructive ways. So we now have a database of about 600 parents who are willing to come in and support the work that we're doing in the classroom um, uh, and in the exhibits and all those kinds of things. So they often come in as experts at different points along the way in, in a project. Um, and you know, the mom who's a doctor comes in for body systems in primary school. You know, the parent who's a business owner comes in and helps the entrepreneurship programs. Um, all of these kinds of supports allow the parents to better understand what we're trying to do and to be involved in our doing it. Second strategy is to offer transformative professional development. So it, it can't just be professional development where you learn, you know, the first step is this, the second step is that, et cetera, because we have to change their brain, their minds and their hearts so much and get them thinking really differently about what teaching looks like. And that's with almost no experience, right? So we are really trying to make sure that um, all of the, the um, professional development is based in project-based learning, that it's oriented toward practice and growth and it being okay to make mistakes and learn from them and try again, um, and really trying to make these experiences where teachers will say, you know what, I know how I felt as a learner in this situation, so now I better understand why I can make these kinds of choices in my own classroom as well. And we have to really make it very visible and very transparent consistently that that's what we're doing so that they will then take the strategies back to their own classrooms. And then finally, we're doing something really different with professional development in that our teachers are doing rubrics, uh, or sorry, are, are creating portfolios. Um, 
that mean they'll be they are asked to observe four classes of their colleagues in the course of the of the year um, one in each section and then a fourth that they can do wherever they prefer um, the idea is not to evaluate their peers but just to learn from them to soak up everything that they experience in those classrooms um, and to use what's useful um, and then they're also asked to do a lot of self-reflection over their own growth using two key rubrics from the Buck Institute, um, translated into Spanish, obviously, the teaching practices rubric and the project design rubric, which they use for self-reflection and include that in their portfolio. And then finally, they also do, we've been working really hard on, on um, PLCs, on professional learning communities. It has not been incredibly successful so far because of an issue of time, I think, more than anything. Um, but it is something that we're working that I hope to see more and more of. Um, and um, of course, the, one of the biggest advantages of using portfolios is that we, this year, we're starting to use student portfolios as well in a few uh, grade levels. And having the teacher's experience at first will help it, make it, makes it much, much easier uh, to convince them that this is something worth doing. Third strategy is to embrace the middle path. Um, this is a term that comes from Buddhism and that I embrace in almost everything that I do in my life. Um, it doesn't have to do with compromise. It has to do with there being a middle path, which is, is most effective because it doesn't represent either of the two extremes, but is right in the middle, um, uniting them, as you can see in the image there, uh, in a way that makes sense. So, so that includes meeting traditional expectations through project-based learning, right? Making sure that the projects really do help us meet those more traditional expectations. And that includes being able to show their results, students learning in traditional ways as much as in uh, more innov innovative ways. So for example, at the end of a given trimester, students will do an exhibition of learning, a celebration of learning, right? Where they'll show these wonderful products that they've created during the course of the trimester. Um, but they'll also often take an exam that allows us to check and see whether they're learning what they're supposed to be learning effectively enough and that prepares them for for traditional exams in the future as well and finally i mean i would say that the goal of all of this strategy really is how do we ensure success in all contexts right how do we make sure that um, that kids, you know, that, that the student who goes on to the most traditional university in the world is going to be incredibly successful in these lecture style courses for four years, but the kid who wants to go to the most progressive school in the world can also be incredibly successful. Um, that the student who wants to, to take a more traditional path and, and work in a big company for their whole lives knows how to do that and can do it well, but the kid who wants to break out and create a new industry can do that too, right? It's all about ensuring the highest level of success possible in any context. I do want to go a little deeper into the exam conundrum and how we're addressing that without destroying the project-based environment. Um, so the first thing is that we're using exam style language in all of our formal assessments in high school. So that means that at the end of each trimester, when they do exams for the different disciplines, we're using the same language or question style that's used in the national exams. And that allows us, without having to do a lot of drill and kill or you know, hours and years of, of practice, practice exams, we're getting them ready for and used to the language. Um, we've also made major improvements to our scope and sequence um, to ensure better um, align with, alignment with the ministry um, because we, we absolutely recognize that without that we can't hope to ensure those high level exam skills. Um, so the better the alignment, the less likely it is that there are going to be holes that will only appear suddenly on a test um, where the kid never learned that because our projects were fun and lovely, but they weren't well enough aligned with the national curriculum to ensure that they would do well. Um, we also have, um, the, we've decided to adopt international English standards um, because the ministry's expectation for English learning is not based on a bilingual environment. We really want our English skill, our students to come out with English skills of a, uh, um, almost as strong as their first language or if possible as strong. Um, and so we've created, we've chosen a set of standards that will allow us to mirror basically the kinds, the, the level that happens in Spanish as well in their native tongue. Um, we have shifted this year toward a really important emphasis on data and instruction and really making good, effective use of data to adjust instruction. It's, this is not something that the teachers necessarily have a lot of experience with, um, and it's something that is, it's definitely an interesting challenge, but we know that it's going to help us make sure that we really are filling gaps when they appear um, and that we're adjusting our instruction to meet those needs. 
Um, and then finally, we also came up with a two-year plan that we're in the first year of right now where we're going to see a little less project-based learning in junior and senior year. Um, so we, we do believe that over two years, we can get to the point where we know that all of our curricular gaps, all the gaps that I inherited are gone, um, and at that point, we'll be able to, to really do PBL across the entire school. The fourth strategy is developing strategic global and local partnerships. Um, and these uh, have been really essential. Um, and I have to be, really give a shout out to every university and program we've been connected with because it's made such a, a huge difference for us. Um, the first is the university alliances. Um, this helps us make sure that the teachers that we receive are more and more prepared. So we receive a lot of um, they call them practicantes, student teachers um, at Caobos, and we would love to have one in almost every classroom. We have no problem with the work involved. We would love to be more involved in the training of these teachers. I also teach some university courses in, in Bogota to make sure that university, um, that, that pre-service teachers get some exposure to project-based learning, but then also um, we've been doing some of that work with university professors as well because we want our students to have a good experience when they get to those universities. And that, I think is one of the keys is that these universities recognizing we're not going to stay relevant if we don't shift with schools like Caobos. Um, so we've been working really hard on that. We do a, um, a big conference every two years on campus. We involve the universities and lots and lots of other schools uh, in that conference uh, because it's all about sharing the learning. We even give um, uh, scholarships for, for public school uh, employees who want to come and be part of it because there are so many um, ways to, to do this work. Um, and maybe at the end, I'll respond to some of these questions too, if that sounds good to you guys. I'd like to make sure that I complete the talk, but I absolutely see some great questions there that I do want to respond to if I can. Um, we are also, you know, partnerships with local and global entrepreneurs and experts and organizations that can help create opportunities for our students, um, as well as growth experiences for our, for our teachers. Um, the, the support of local business people and entrepreneurs um, has been incredibly, incredibly important. Um, entrepreneurship is alive and well in Colombia. I think there's a very clear recognition that innovation is the key to the future of this country. Um, so it's been really uh, gratifying to make use of those those kinds of connections. And then of course, the global partnerships for learning. I mean, I think this year we have about 10 major global projects going on, which is a lot for a school that had almost none when I arrived. Um, and it's been a long learning curve. I don't, I, you know, as the global education expert on campus, I'm running the school. I don't have a whole lot of time to support the work, um, uh, you know, on the ground level um, with the teachers. And so we've been doing some, you know, a lot of creative things and, and really finding ways to, to improve those experiences for kids, that it's not just learning in isolation inside the schoolhouse or even inside of Columbia. Um, one really great experience, uh, example of that, of course, is the work that we've done with Terry Godwalt's organization in Edmonton, the Center for Global Education. We, we were able to send students to the IPCC my first year to represent Columbia in, in those climate change talks. Um, we sent students to Poland last year for COP as well, um, and but also did online work with younger students who maybe weren't going to get to travel um, through the programming that Terry offers. Um, and then um, this year we'll be going to Spain, the, the new shift of country, but we will be going to Spain. So those kinds of experiences where kids get to really represent youth voice um, have been incredibly uh, helpful. And this is just one, obviously, one example of that. Um, and the, the last strategy, which I think is so important, is that we've been empowering student voice in the change process. Um, I learned this lesson very early in my career, um, and it was Judith Bannon, actually, at St. Mary's Academy who taught me this lesson, and that is that we, when we empower student voice, when the change comes from the kids themselves, um, we actually really do accomplish a lot more, a lot more quickly. Um, when it comes from the adults, sometimes there's a perception that we're pushing something on the kids, but when it comes from the kids, it's authentic. It's, it has to be done because the kids know that it has to be done, you know, um, and it's allowed us to take on some of the hardest social issues you can imagine. Um, the student you see in this picture is a young woman who came to us at the beginning of high school. She wasn't with us from four years old up. She came to us because she was suffering her education in a rigorous environment and didn't want to be there anymore and came to um, Calabos. Um, and she got to go to the IPCC in Edmonton and was actively involved in our environmental club. And ultimately, 
ultimately um, what you see behind her, which is a wall of there, there are there's information about how to recycle and why we should recycle, but there are also bins for um, the tops of, of bottles, the plastic tops. Um, there, there's a bin for ba batteries. There are bins for obviously all the different types of traditional um, recycling. Um, and, and then right behind her, blocked by her in this image, is a water filling station, um, one of the kinds that tells you how many water bottles you've saved from the environment. Um, I went around and checked before I gave this talk, um, and we are at about 15,000 bottles saved from the environment in just six months of having two of these dispensers on campus. And that would never have happened without this student. She figured out how to raise the money. She figured out where to put them, which organizations would come collect things from the different bins. Um, and then she graduated. So she left us with this legacy. So that's an example of the senior capstone project at the bottom of my list there, um, my community, my passion. Um, we also make sure that our student government isn't just you know, uh, in name only. Uh, we really do try to make sure that they have uh, true power uh, in the sense that there is student representation in most of our committees um, and in most of our decision-making processes. Um, lots of projects like the one about um, uh, stereotypes that are geared toward um, the community uh, and to improving our relationships and our culture on campus. And that's been incredibly, incredibly successful as well um, at really helping us to yeah, to get the kids involved at the ground floor. So I used that example earlier of breaking stereotypes. And I told you guys that that, that was a teacher who was brand new to us and super pissed off uh, to find that kids were being mean to each other. And the boys were calling each other girls and, you know, sissy and all this kind of gender oriented, you know, like uh, using feminine um, uh, adjectives, right, to describe the boys, things like that, that were stereotypical and bad behavior. And by shifting that, oh, I'm so angry at this it makes me so mad to how could I create a project that would address it um, where the kids are going to solve the problem for me. It's the same thing that I did with Cafe Con la Rectora, right, where I stopped letting them just complain and I said, okay, so how would you solve this problem? Let's get you involved in it and it made all the difference. So I really do think that student voice is the key. I think in a lot of schools, unfortunately, student voice is very tokenistic and I invite any of you who are leaders to really think about ways that students could become more um, centrally and authentically involved in your processes and could really help you to, to build something even better. I will mention that all of the material that I've shared today and more detail is in a chapter that I wrote for this book, um, which just came out last month, um, uh, edited by Jason Richardson. The, the whole book is exceptional. Um, there are some really extraordinary stories from all over the world of schools that are doing innovative things on an international level. Um, and I certainly encourage you to take a look. It's, I, and I'm, certainly my story is in there. You've heard mo most of my story right here. Um, but I hope that these are, are valuable, that all the chapters and vignettes are really valuable to educators and leaders who are trying to do something different in a variety of contexts. I want to end, and then I will come back to the questions after this. If that sounds good, I'll wrap up and then go to the questions. Um, I want to end on the words of Boyan Slat. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a young Dutchman who um, created a system for getting the plastic out of the garbage patches of the oceans around the world. Um, his first pilot is in place, as far as I know, in the, the Pacific garden, uh, garbage patch right now. Um, and one of the things that he says, and, and he's, I think, 21 or 22, youngest ever recipient of the UNEP uh, Champions of the Earth uh, Award. Um, one of the things he said has really stuck with me, and he says it in several of his talks. He says that history is basically a list of things that couldn't be done, and then were done. And I really want to invite everyone in this audience to think about what that might mean for your schools and your classrooms. I think there are a few things that are important to point out. The first would be that we often, without ever meaning to, just completely squash the, uh, the innovative ideas of young people in our environments when they say, what if we, and we say, oh, that's impossible. Um, and in those moments, I suspect that we're shutting off something that could become real. Um, 
that could really make a difference. Um, and I, and I, so I really think on a basic level that all teachers have to stop saying that's impossible and say, Ooh, that sounds challenging and wonderful. How might we do it instead of that's impossible. Um, but the other thing is in the school itself and in the way that we teach and educate and the way we think about learning and, and educating, um, especially in private schools where we're worried about making sure that we get the students necessary to keep afloat and keep the, the ship moving um, that, it can often feel like we should just go back to the way that things have always been done. There's a comfort in the way that things have always been done. And there's a lot that's unknown and fearful in trying something different. But history is basically a list of things that couldn't be done and then we're done. There's nothing to suggest that these movements in education are impossible. Um, and there's nothing in my environment, certainly in Columbia, that suggests that this is not the way to educate young people. Um, it's scary and it's very, very new for the context that I'm in. Um, but perhaps that makes it even more important than we do it. So um, I want to close by just thanking all of you for being a part of this. I, I do want to say, as always, that I, um, I love this kind of work. It's been the hardest job I've ever had, no question. It's been a very, very difficult place for me to be um, and very difficult work for me to do. Um, but I'm seeing the results. I am seeing the rewards. Kids understand why it matters and we can, we're can. we really getting somewhere now. Um, and I know that the people who work with me, um, the, t the teachers, the administrators, the people who are on the ground level really making this work happen, um, uh, believe in what we're doing and and the parents too um, we're really getting to that point now where I can say okay I don't see I don't see parents and want to flee <laughs> I, I want to go up and give them a, a kiss on the cheek and hear something good from them um, so I, I'm here and available I'm glad to help schools around the world uh, particularly in Latin America but honestly anywhere um, if you're interested in training your teachers or doing work with your leaders um, I love to support this work I believe it's the future I was inspired as a child by Arnie to believe that that I could create change through this kind of work. Um, and I want to thank all of you for, for being here and being part of it. I'm going to go to the questions now. Steve, it's up to you if you want to keep filming or not. But I know that oh, yeah. In fact, we almost kind of have to stop so okay. people can go to the next set of sessions. Okay. Awesome job. Way to go. Thank you. It 